Welcome to the Holy Land and this biblical site of the Red Sea. We're filming this just a little bit down from Eilat, just a few miles from the Egyptian border. And we are at the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea, the believed place where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Absolutely phenomenal, the miracle that took place and the miracles that surrounded the nation of Israel, their deliverance out of Egypt and going into the Promised Land. We're gonna be looking at the route that the Israelites took after they left Egypt and as they arrived to Mount Sinai. Now the miracle surrounding the Exodus, the Red Sea crossing, God's supernatural leading, protection, provision, and the events at Mount Sinai are absolutely massive in size. In fact, other than creation and Christ's time on earth, we have no bigger miracles. These miracles speak of God's greatness, salvation, provision, and moral laws for how we should live. In this video, we are going to let the Bible be our guide and follow its lead. Unfortunately, many today try to explain these miracles away or claim that they were fulfilled in a natural way. However, you are going to be amazed when we look at the Bible closely and see the extent and magnitude of these miracles. At the end of this video, we will look at some faith lessons I believe God wants us to understand. So sit back and behold these miracles and stay tuned until the end for how all this applies to our lives today. In part one of this video, we are going to look at the Exodus, the miraculous crossing of the wilderness and the Red Sea crossing. In part two, we will look at the route that the Israelites took to Mount Sinai after they crossed the Red Sea and Mount Sinai itself. The evidence for the route that they took and the evidence at Mount Sinai is absolutely amazing. So for many years, it was believed that the Israelites crossed the Gulf of the Suez finger of the Red Sea, just east of what is now Cairo, Egypt. However, there are no deep bodies of water in these areas, just shallow marshes and lakes. For this reason, the biblical account of this astounding miracle has been questioned by some scholars and has been somewhat discredited to make the Bible out to, to be not really true, but that's not the case whatsoever. And we're gonna show you amazing evidence in this video that shows that this is the area where the Israelites crossed the Red Sea and they were almost about a half of a mile underneath the water in the only spot on the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea where it's possible for them to go down and come up. So many recent archeologists and scholars now believe the Israelites crossed the Red Sea at the Gulf of the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea and that Mount Sinai, where the Israelites were headed, is located in Midian, which is modern day Arabia, modern day Saudi Arabia. So Midian was in Saudi Arabia, not in the Sinai Peninsula. In this video, we're gonna be talking about this fascinating miracle and looking at strong evidence which confirms the modern day belief that the Israelites crossed the Red Sea on the Gulf of Aqaba finger of the Red Sea and that Mount Sinai is located in modern day Saudi Arabia. Now the traditional place right now where Mount Sinai is believed to be located is in the Sinai Peninsula. However, we don't believe that is the true location and like I say there is monumental astounding evidence that shows now that the site of Mount Sinai is actually in Saudi Arabia and the Bible supports that we'll be talking about that so let's look at the backdrop of this story to really fully understand the profoundness of this miracle now God called Abraham and said he would make a great nation out of his offspring and Abraham left everything to follow God. Abraham birthed Isaac, who birthed Jacob, who birthed 12 sons, and God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So that's where we get the nation of Israel. Jacob and his 12 sons moved to Egypt according to God's sovereign plan. There were about 75 in all who left and went into Egypt. The Israelites spent 400 years in Egypt. During this time, they grew into a people of around 2.5 to 3 million people. 
absolutely amazing. And in their latter years of their time in Egypt, they became slaves and were mistreated. Then God supernaturally raised up Moses to deliver the Israelites out of the slavery and bondage and miraculously lead them to the promised land. Moses initially attempted to do this in his own strength and wound up killing an Egyptian who was fighting with an Israelite. Pharaoh heard of this and became angry with Moses. So Moses fled to the land of Midian. Exodus 2.15 says, When Pharaoh heard about this matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. He most likely took the main travel route that went from Egypt to Midian at that time. Now Midian is in modern day Saudi Arabia. Moses then married a Midianite woman who was the daughter of a priest in Midian. One day when Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep, God appeared to him in a burning bush at Mount Sinai. Exodus 3.1 states, Now Moses was pastoring the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same place. Notice that Mount Horeb was on the west side of the wilderness. The believed location of the current day Mount Sinai fits this biblical description. Then God promised Moses that he would bring the Israelites back to the same mountain to worship him. In Exodus 3.12 it says, And he said, God speaking, Assuredly, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. From these verses, we see clearly that Mount Sinai was in Midian, and where God appeared to Moses was the same place that the Israelites came to at Mount Sinai after the Exodus. And in Galatians 4.25, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us exactly where Mount Sinai is. It says, now this Hagar is Mount Sinai. Now he's going to tell us where this Mount Sinai is. This Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is enslaved with her children. So Paul says Mount Sinai is in Arabia, not in the Sinai Peninsula. Now God performed a miraculous deliverance of the Israelite nation from Egypt by performing 10 amazing miracles. Each of these miracles was targeted at one of the false gods of Egypt. The last miracle, known as the Passover, is when God killed the firstborn of all the Egyptians who did not put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their homes. The deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt was done to show several deep theological truths. To show God's power and glory, that he is above all gods and is the one true God. To be a foreshadow of salvation, that God would save us in the same manner that he saved the Israelites out of the nation of Egypt. So it's a kind of a prototype foreshadow of salvation. And to teach his chosen people how to follow and obey him, which would give them life if they were to do so. And to show his power and glory to the other nations. Now let's look at this amazing miracle and learn some fascinating things about it that I bet you probably don't know. Now, how many Israelites left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea? What was the size of the Israelite nation? Well, in Exodus 12, it says, Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. So by doing the math, we can arrive at about 2.5 to 3 million people. Now, how many Egyptian soldiers were pursuing the Israelites when they left Egypt? It says in Exodus 14, so he made his chariot ready and took his people with him. And he took 600 select chariots and all of the other chariots of Egypt with officers over them. 
According to Josephus, a historian writer, a Jewish historian writer, there were about 50,000 horsemen and about 200,000 foot soldiers that pursued the Israelites, about a quarter of a million almost. It would have been impossible for such a large army to have drowned in shallow lakes and marshes just beside Goshen because the bodies of water, the finger of the Red Sea by Goshen, by Cairo, is very shallow. In fact, it's just marshes. So that's why, as I said, many scholars have tried to, liberal scholars have tried to discredit God's word, but that's not the case. They did not cross there, they crossed here. Now the reason some believe that the Israelites crossed the sea close by to Egypt is because of how the Hebrew words Yom Suf and specifically Suf is translated. The translation of the word Yom means sea or large body of water and Suf mainly means end, edge, shoreline, red and a few times as reeds. Therefore, some believe the Israelites crossed just east of Egypt because there are many shallow waters with reeds there. However, the words Yom Suf together are mentioned 24 times in the Old Testament, with seven of them referring to specific locations which are around the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea and not by Egypt. For example, in Exodus 23:31, the word is used to describe the boundary of Israel going from the Aqaba northern tip of the Red Sea by a lot to the Sea of the Philistines, which would be the Mediterranean Sea. In 1 Kings 9:26, Yom Suf refers again to the northern tip of the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea and is where Solomon had a fleet of ships stationed at Eloth, which is modern day Eilat. Therefore, the term Yom Suf does not only mean reeds and refer to the area east of Egypt. The term is mainly used of the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea. Taking this into account, the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea is referred to as Yom Suf many times in the Bible. And also, there has never been any real convincing evidence, nothing found, nor archaeological evidence found by Cairo, Egypt, that would support the fact that the Israelites crossed there. There has been, however, much evidence found, archaeological evidence, to show that the crossing was here and that Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. So there has been a lot of discoveries made that I am excited uh, to share with you. To begin with, God said that he brought them out of Egypt on the very same day that he left. So it says that they left Egypt and he brought them out of Egypt. The border of Egypt was the Gulf of Suez finger of the Red Sea. Any place the Israelites would have crossed the Gulf of Suez finger of the Red Sea, they would still have been in Egypt. So he said on the very same day he led them out and they went out of Egypt. So they had to be outside of and past the Suez Canal finger of the Red Sea or they would have still been in Egypt. Now it is true that the Egyptians had a presence in the Sinai Peninsula, but their main border ran from the Mediterranean Sea to the Suez finger of the Red Sea and southward. Now scripture strongly indicates that they traveled a long time through a wilderness before crossing the Red Sea. Now this is very key, so pay really close attention. In Exodus 13, it says, and this would be proof that they had to cross the Sinai Peninsula and they did not stay and they did not cross at the finger of the Red Sea by Cairo, Egypt or by Goshen. In Exodus 13 it says, Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the Philistines, and that was kind of the northern part up there, even though it was near. For God said that people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So he didn't lead them north. He led them around the tip of the Suez Canal or the finger of the Red Sea there by Suez, by Goshen. And then he brought them south, east, towards the Red Sea here. So a scripture says, hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness 
wilderness, now that's key, to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. Then they set out from Succoth and camped in Etham on the edge of the wilderness. Between Goshen and the Red Sea is no wilderness, so they were beyond the Suez Canal tip of the Red Sea out into the wilderness. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel, pay really close attention, so that they might travel by day and by night. So this would mean that they traveled by day and by night. They did not stop. They had a pillar by night, they had a cloud by day, so they were traveling day and night through this wilderness, through this, the Sinai Peninsula. It says, He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. This would mean the Israelites walked a long way by traveling both day and night. So they traveled a long ways. The Gulf of Suez finger of the Red Sea is right next to Goshen, only about 20 miles. So it says here that they traveled by day and night for a long ways. It's only 20 miles. It just wouldn't fit the biblical narrative. The Sinai Peninsula is a great wilderness and would fit the evidence found at the believed crossing at the Gulf of Aqaba, finger of the Red Sea. So the biblical narrative fits this place here and research has shown that a person could cross the wilderness in three days, traveling day and night by walking just three or so miles an hour, which is just a normal walking pace for a person. Scripture also says there were no feeble ones among them and that he carried them on eagle's wings during their exodus. So on eagle's wings, he carried them and there was no feeble one among them. So a pillar of fire by night a cloud by day, and they traveled day and night for some period of time till they reached the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea. The crossing of the Red Sea happened several days afterward, so they couldn't have crossed the Gulf of Suez finger of the Red Sea because it is just 20 miles from Goshen. Now Moses would have led the nation of Israel on the main trade route that went from Egypt to Arabia and Midian. However, just before arriving at the northern tip of the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea, God redirected their path so that he might display his glory to Israel, Egypt, and the surrounding nations. Exodus 14.1 provides the details. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell the sons of Israel to turn back and camp in front of pi Hathoroth, between Migdol and the sea. You shall camp in front of baal Siphon, opposite it, by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the sons of Israel, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will chase after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And they did so. This explains why they left the main travel route and arrived at the Nueva Beach of the Aqaba Finger of the Red Sea. There has also been found in the Gulf of Aqaba Finger of the Red Sea, in the area of Nueva Port, amazing evidence of coral growth on objects that look like old chariot wheels, axles, and so forth. It has been found on the shore across from Nueva Port on the Saudi Arabian side, these same figures. So you can see in this video here, this amazing coral figures that look like axles, that look like chariot wheels, and they're just all strewn out as you go from Nueva out into the Red Sea, and then on the shore coming up out of the Red Sea on the Saudi Arabian side as well. Now, you should know that coral doesn't grow in sandy areas. It must have rock or something solid to grow on. And this area where they crossed is just pure sand. So these figures are tremendous evidence of chariot wheels 
that would have come off from the Egyptians as they pursued the Israelites. The area where the Israelites would have camped is large and can accommodate three million people. So this Nueva port here that you can see is huge and it would easily have accommodated three million uh, people. Now, interestingly, the sea in this area, the ocean floor of this part, gradually goes down and then gradually goes up. Just north and south of this area are deep crevices, deep ravines in the ocean floor where the Israelites could not have crossed. So of the Aqaba finger of the Red Sea, there's this perfect spot where it's sandy, goes down gradually, goes up gradually, but it goes down almost a half of a mile down in the ocean. Now, Scripture continually refers to the crossing where the Israelites crossed as the Israelites going down into mighty waters. So this term, mighty waters, is used frequently in Scripture to talk about the crossing where they went into the water. Let's look at a couple of these passages which are staggering. In Exodus 14 it says, But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. Now Isaiah 51 says, Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep? The great deep, the water is very shallow, close to Goshen on the Suez Canal side of the Red uh, Sea. Very shallow, marshes. Here it is deep, so it fits the text. You led them through the waters of the great deep, great focus on that word great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway. The depths, we're talking deep down in the ocean, the depths of the sea as a, as a pathway for the redeemed to cross over. Now the lake beds and marshes by Egypt were certainly not waters of the great deep. They were very shallow marshes. Also, Solomon referred to the Gulf of Aqaba here as the Red Sea in 1 Kings. So he talks about his ships coming here, and he calls this the Red Sea. So this is not a new term. It's a biblical term, this Aqaba, finger of the Red Sea. Now, when the Israelites came to the Red Sea at the location of Nueva, they were certainly hemmed in, as Scripture says. Scripture says that they were hemmed in. It says in Exodus 14, But Moses said to the people, do not fear, stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. And then the hand of God performed one of the most staggering, greatest miracles ever recorded in scripture. Think about this, 2.5 to 3 million people crossing an ocean. It's about eight miles from one side to the other here of the finger of the Red Sea here. So it says in Exodus 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? The Israelites were thinking that they were going to be destroyed by the Egyptians. They're hemmed in. They're panicking. And God says, Why are you crying out to me, Moses? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel, and there was the cloud along with the darkness, yet it gave light at night. Thus the one did not come near the other all night. So God provided a supernatural barrier between them that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept back the sea by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. So the east wind would have come from the Saudi Arabia side coming into a, a kind of a headwind to them because the east is where the dry, arid wind is. So the waters were divided. 
The sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. Then the Egyptians took up the pursuit, and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen went in after them, in after the Israelites, into the midst, once again, middle midst of the sea. At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians. So it appears that the Israelites crossed over and were over. God removed the barrier, the pillar, and the Egyptians then, God drove them in, supernaturally caused them to come in in His sovereignty to display His glory. And so then the Egyptians went into the midst. And it says, At the morning watch, the Lord looked down on the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the army of the Egyptians into confusion. He caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against us, they were saying. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that has gone into the sea after them. Not one of them remained. And once again, you can see in this video, these chariot wheels and the remains of what God did and how he caused confusion to the Egyptians as they were in the midst of the sea. But the sons of Israel, it says once again, walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them. It repeats this over, on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So they had witnessed this astounding miracle and they are just in a state of fear, a state of awe, a state of reverent fear before God. Now once again, this coral growth close to the shore across from Nueva port show the same figures of chariot wheels, axes and so forth as found in the sea close to Nueva port. So once again, as they went in, you see these chariot wheels. As they went out, you see them, then they're just strewn through the bottom of the ocean floor. Now, interestingly, there have been found columns or pillars on the beach of Nueva and on the Saudi Arabian side that are believed markers that King Solomon built to mark the crossing of the Red Sea by the Israelites. The pillar on the Nueva side has been found and erected, but the pillar on the Saudi Arabian side has been removed by the government and a marker has been placed there. However, Ron Wyatt, who did much investigation about this area, found and documented the pillar on the Saudi Arabian side in the 80s. Now, what are some faith lessons we can learn from this video and the places we've seen? The miracles of the Exodus, Red Sea Crossing, God's supernatural leading of the Israelites, and all that happened at Mount Sinai are massive miracles that reveal God's glory and greatness. They teach us deep theological truths that God wants us to believe and embrace. Truth like God's greatness, ability to help and rescue us out of our sin and problems, how God is able to provide for us, protect us, and lead us are foundational concepts these miracles communicate. God wants us to believe them instead of doubting and trying to explain them away, or believe they happen by natural means, as many liberal scholars attempt to do. God actually calls unbelief a sin in His Word, in Hebrews 3.12, it says, Take care, brothers and sisters, that there will not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So actually, God calls unbelief a sin and even evil. 
while the miracles of the Exodus, Red Sea crossing, and the events that happened at Mount Sinai are massive in size, they are tiny in comparison to God's greater miracles of creating everything that exists, giving life to everyone that exists, and sustaining everything that exists. Acts 17, 27 says, He, talking about God, is not far from any one of us. For in Him, or because of Him, we live and move and exist. It is God who actually gives life to our bodies and spirits, and it's Him who allows us to live, move, and exist. When I listen to liberal theologians explaining away the miracles of the Exodus, Red Sea crossing, and events at Mount Sinai and so forth, I can't help but think that if God was to remove His sustaining power from their lives, they would cease to exist in that very moment. God was deeply grieved with the Israelites who doubted His power and ability on many occasions. He can also be deeply grieved with us today when we do the same. Unlike Moses, who tried to fulfill God's promise in his own strength and wound up killing an Egyptian, we should wait on God's timing and not force things when they don't happen as we think they should. We should never do evil or manipulate things in fulfilling God's will for us. In part two, we will look at the route that the Israelites took to Mount Sinai after they crossed the Red Sea and Mount Sinai itself. The evidence for the route that they took and the evidence at Mount Sinai is absolutely amazing. Well, thanks for watching part one of this video series and may God richly bless you.